um, basically we can all take initiatives if we think in silence to the voice of conscience, we can move forward into new territories and make difference. But uh, we can also draw inspiration from our speakers and um, John is certainly someone from whom we can draw inspiration. And um, without further ado, I think I'll, uh, I'll give him the word. Um, he has a very long CV, which I will not try to uh, summarize. You have seen in the invitation uh, a little part of that. He has a long experience in um, hospitality as, as a manager and a CEO. And he's today the chairman co-founder or co-founder and co-chairman, sorry, of PeaceCity.World. And that's how we, how we came into contact and why we like to listen to you, John. Well, thank you very much. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And thank you to Initiatives of Change. Thank you, Manir. Uh, I would like to start by introducing myself as the... Uh, as was said, I'm the uh, chairman and uh, co-founder of Peace City World. Uh, the company uh, is a company that is based on the principles of creating peace through economic stimulus and development. And uh, we're developing new cities. Uh, Manir, if you could change to the next one, please. Uh, I'd like to start because all of us have a family story. And uh, I always look back on uh, where the concept of peace and uh, righteousness and doing good uh, was uh, embedded in me within my family. I grew up uh, with my uh, grandparents and my grandparents, uh, of course, my, my mother and father were there and all of them had experienced war. All of them had experienced hardship. Uh, they went through, my grandmother uh, went through the First World War uh, the Great Depression, bringing up children, my mother, my uh, uh, father was in World War II, uh, my uncle, my mother's brother, my grandmother's son uh, was killed in World War II, liberating Tunisia. Uh, and I grew up in the Vietnam era, which uh, many of you will have remembered. And uh, since then, we've had constant war. Uh, we haven't faced peace. Uh, we had lots of technical change. Uh, and I remember my grandmother, she always uh, had this positive outlook in spite of it all, because she believed in people, she believed in good. And uh, she passed that to me. Hopefully I can pass that to others. And I appreciate being here today. Um, as far as uh, her world, uh, she was in a world where there was no technology, zero technology. Uh, they had horses, they had uh, uh, the origination of the motor car, uh, and uh, my grandfather, who was born in the 1800s, who fought in World War I, uh, he had the same, and uh, they were in the Industrial Revolution, where they were going from uh, agriculture uh, to industrialization, mm -hmm. And at that time, before uh, World War II, there was probably about 90% of the global population was in agriculture. Today, there's less than 2%, and it's owned by multinational corporations in the most part, uh, except for subsistence farmers in Africa and Asia and certain parts of the world, in South America, possibly. And, and so basically, as we went into industrialization, we saw a change in the climate. We have seen that and we're feeling the effects now. And uh, as we turn from industrialization to technology, then uh, we have to use this technology for good. Uh, next slide, please, Munir. And so how do we, uh, how do we see life on the planet uh, in, for this uh, current young generation and future generations. And uh, we're looking at uh, 11 to 12 billion people on the planet where 70 to 80% of the entire global population will live in cities. Okay, and and hey. for, for these cities, we're looking at a situation where uh, uh, across five continents, we're looking to build as a company, Peace City World, uh, 10 to 20 new cities. 
And just to give you a perspective, in India, they're looking at building 100 new cities to, to cope with the uh, expanding population. Uh, in England, where I live, uh, they're looking to build 14 new cities. Uh, and, and that just puts it on the scale of uh, the developing uh, and movement of the world. People are uh, uh, relocating around the world. Uh, people are currently being uh, displaced now uh, in Ukraine. Uh, they've been displaced in uh, uh, Middle Eastern countries in recent years. In Africa, uh, they're being displaced through economic and, and hunger. And uh, so we need to do something uh, as a human race together and unite together. And our objective is to link these new cities uh, to become global hubs, global hubs for business, but global hubs that uh, uh, create new human habitats that will support millions of people, create jobs, develop the economies of these countries uh, in an ecological manner. And all of this can be master planned into the development of these cities. So our general global purpose is the same as the United Nations in uniting humanity, humanity for a uh, better life on our planet. Uh, next, Munir. Uh, this is just uh, a good picture, not of me, but of my partner, uh, Dr. Riyad Tukabri, uh, who helped found uh, uh, Peace City World with me. And Riyadh has the same ethics as, as does our uh, uh, team. Uh, we all are uh, uh, caring people about uh, the planet, about uh, our uh, fellow citizens on the planet and uh, our future and the future of the children on the planet. Next, please. Uh, despite the unrest uh, and trouble and risk and conflict uh, and just to let you know, uh, part of my experience, I was in the U.S. Marines, and in, that was in the 70s. And in the 70s, uh, I was pretty gung-ho and pretty much uh, a, a very, very focused individual, much more than I am now in my older age. But at that time, uh, I was very much in belief of uh, uh, what I was doing was right. I still think what I did was right, but at some point I learned in that experience that the U.S. had not been out of war for more than five years in its history. Uh, and that was taught to us as part of one of the lessons that we took. That stuck in my head and I said to myself that we've got to do something more than just business as usual. Uh, in saying that, there's probably about $10 trillion a year spent on war, defense, and uh, uh, keeping uh, security of countries. This is because uh, uh, of troubles, of war, of uh, uh, countries attacking each other, countries uh, uh, really trying to occupy, take land, do other things. And this is ongoing. There's a big mistrust and we need to break that cycle. Uh, Myself and Dr. Riyad, uh, as it says, we uh, were both inspired by the concept of peace. Our uh, platform of Peace City World is profit from doing good, because we feel that corporations are very short-term thinkers. They, they think the quarter of the business cycle that they're in, and unless there's a, unless there's a vision of profit, they won't participate. So we create a, we create a uh, platform where all of our projects are for profit, but they, the side effect of that is through their contribution, through their efforts, through their collaboration, it actually creates good for the citizens in their own countries and in the uh, host country where we're gonna build cities. Uh, the platform uh, of Peace City World is a turnkey sustainable economic city, uh, and we're the master developer. Uh, the company was established in 2019. Although in saying that, we've been, myself and Dr. Riyad have been working on the same line in this type of development, each for more than 10 years prior to that. And we actually met in uh, Singapore uh, at a uh, conference. And then we met later where we were both guest speakers at a peace conference at UN Peace Day in uh, Seoul, Korea. And uh, then later we met again in Jakarta, we decided we'd form a company together. And uh, so we created Peace City World. 
Peace City World is a turnkey solution uh, and as a master developer, uh, much more than a construction company, we've actually united more than a dozen construction companies to come with us to actually build and develop new cities. So we could try and build one company ourselves, one construction company, and to get to the size of what we're talking about, it would take us lifetimes. But by participation of other companies in joining our platform to create peace cities, we can actually create cities, not in 100 years, not in 50 years, but actually in 10 years from start to finish. So if we can do that in one location and we have global corporate participation, government participation, UN participation, NGO participation, and all, all good people who want to invest and help others, uh, we can actually uh, do more than be a real estate company. We can actually achieve global peace through economic stimulus, through raising people's qualities of life, and through developing uh, new habitats. Uh, we're actually an alliance of uh, hundreds of companies, and uh, we have, uh, through artificial intelligence, we have about uh, 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 150,000 global companies who are looking to invest somewhere. They don't know where yet. They're looking for good opportunities. Uh, our cities are called peace cities, and they're actually branded cities. And so the concept is to link these cities together for trade, education, healthcare, uh, developing sports cities within our cities, uh, uh, technology hubs for regions, and raising the education level of the local populace, and through them providing uh, uh, an education base in their own country, the whole country will raise up. Uh, and we're moving, as we're in currently the technology age, uh, I think that uh, a peace city uh, has to use technology. Uh, and technology can be used in the wrong way too, so we have to be careful with that. And we're going to ensure that in our peace cities, technology is used for the benefit of the population. Uh, peace City is a master planned and built smart, sustainable economic city appropriate for the host nation. So what that means is we're going to actually develop what the people in that country want. We're not just going to throw in a bunch of buildings and, and make a profit and run. We're not just a developer. We're a company who, you know, we're not going to live forever and we have to create something more that's sustainable, that's long lasting that actually uh, gives a quality of life to humans. In the past, cities were built for car cars and automobiles and quick profit. And uh, now we have to do something better than that. We have to have a long-term view. Uh, and this will attract investors, lenders, entrepreneurs, and uh, lots of buyers because people want to come and live in those cities. And we want to have the epitome of what a city would be uh, in its ideal situation. Uh, Peace City uh, should be built to uh, align with UN Sustainable Development Goals. And if you look at actually the Sustainable Development Goals, all of them can be addressed in how we uh, design, how we build, how we structure, and how we create laws and governance of a city. And it doesn't have to be on the, the national scale. It can be as small as a village. And you can, you can implement these things and it, it's basically people power. Uh, and if we design a good city where there's uh, food security, there's no hunger. Uh, and if you, you go through all of it, you go through every point of the UN Sustainable Development Goals, we can address these in our master planning and we can work with the governments to ensure that these are addressed. And so that, uh, this is, a, a, again, a one, one uh, turnkey view of how we can address sustainable development goals from scratch rather than having to go back in later and we're addressing one, two, three, five of them. We can address all of them and that's our objective. Next, please, Munir. So in saying, uh, you know, Peace City wants to contribute to a better world. Uh, everybody that's with our team is caring. We're not just uh, people out to make uh, big money. And uh, we want to look uh, uh, for more than just a profit. 
uh, we want to uh, ensure that the world uh, has uh, something for future generations and that nobody is left behind. Uh, we want peace cities where people have jobs and we need to bring corporations and companies for that. Um, what's happening is, is you have many cities that are built around one industry. We need to diversify. We need to uh, create jobs for people so that they can uh, feed their children, so that they can have housing. So, and so Henry Ford was a great uh, visionary. He actually paid his uh, workers uh, more than the national average, actually two times the national average, because uh, he felt that if they could have that, they could buy his cars and they'd be, they'd be uh, uh, good citizens and uh, uh, he'd raise the prosperity of the economy. There aren't many companies with that vision anymore. And so we want to be that kind of company and we want to build a platform and we think through negotiating incentives from the governments, we can pass those incentives on to our corporation partners and uh, we can create that type of system. Um, next, Munir. Uh, we want to help develop countries and we don't see ourselves just as a, uh, 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 a master developer, we're actually a builder of countries. Uh, peace City World has an ecosystem and a platform of peace and we want to in, embed that into the countries. And as I said before, we have hundreds of corporate partners and that's over the, just the last couple of years. And we signed agreements with these corporations. Some of them are really huge, huge corporations that are doing uh, $30 billion a year in turnover and uh, individually, not, not as a group. And we have uh, uh, hundreds of uh, uh, potential uh, uh, companies that we're working with and talking to now, in addition to those, and we'll continue. And eventually we'll have thousands and thousands of companies that will go anywhere in the world with us because they know they can make a profit. And through them wanting to make a profit, we can translate that into doing good for the residents of those uh, uh, host countries. And as I say, we have 150,000 companies uh, through artificial intelligence looking for locations to develop their business, expand their business, and where the new hub and economic hub will be. Now, what is a peace city? A peace city is a, a combination of our construction, our technology, uh, and the embedding of the uh, UN Sustainable Development Goals as our principle of why we're building the city. And uh, a smart city is basically uh, construction and technology. And uh, it's easier to embed the uh, technology before you build the city. If you've already got an older city, it's harder to uh, run all the, all the uh, cabling, all the uh, lighting, all, everything's, you know, it's much easier to do it from scratch. Now, a, uh, a smart city is a peace city. So we have a smart technology. We have global investment. We have global corporation partners. We create jobs and this creates peace. So it's a united effort for everybody to come together on the planet and join us. And we have open arms for any company, uh, any uh, bank, any uh, investment fund, uh, and uh, we have lots of ideas on how we can uh, raise capital. And we have lots of interested parties, funds, banks uh, who want to join us already. Next, Munir. So basically what's important is uh, citizen engagement in any, uh, any uh, democracy, any uh, country. And for freedom, if the citizens aren't engaged, you know, their freedoms are... Uh, are going to be lost. Uh, so we, we also need security of the citizen. Uh, and uh, that means physical security. So there's good uh, uh, police who look after the people. And we have uh, uh, surveillance that isn't used to uh, suppress people. We have cyber security. Uh, because uh, I don't know if you're aware, but last year, there was again, $10 trillion hacked around the world. And they're forecasting that it'll be 25 trillion in the next three years. And a lot of that is being done by state hacking. 
And so we're working with uh, a lot of cyber professionals and uh, I'm in the U.S. at the moment and I'm having meetings with some of them. And uh, we have also some in Switzerland and also in the U.K. And we're also looking at uh, a company that uh, uh, creates uh, uh, protection from electronic magnetic pulse. And if you don't know what that is, basically it's where if there's a sun flare or if there's an electro electronic uh, bomb goes off in the air, uh, it will wipe out, uh, or, or a nuclear bomb, it will wipe out all the electric uh, for a city. So if we can protect against that and make the city secure, it's a city that people will actually can survive and live in, and that's real, that's real sustainability. Um, we need to look at the uh, things like the economy, uh, and we need a long-term view, uh, health and social care, uh, we need uh, people with skills, so we need a lifetime education for our cities. And uh, it's, not, it's not just, uh, you know, you do your 12 years of school and you're finished, or if you're lucky or can afford it, you can go to university. We need to create a new platform, a new system where people can have lifetime education, because even at any age, uh, you're never too old to learn something. Uh, next, please, Munir. Uh, we're actually speaking with a number of hospital organizations. Uh, we have uh, hospital groups in Europe and hospital groups in the U.S. And uh, we have uh, others potentially from Asia uh, that are willing to come and establish hospitals in what we term as medical cities. And uh, this will create uh, uh, learning centers, actually the physical hospitals, of course, uh, research and development in countries that don't even have hospitals uh, and uh, uh, training centers uh, for nurses, for doctors, uh, for technicians. And uh, this again will raise the quality of life of the uh, people of those uh, host countries. Next please. Universities, we've spoken to uh, multiple universities and uh, again, the universities, uh, people don't think of them as it, but universities are businesses. And if we can make a business case for a university to expand and have branches in other countries uh, where possibly uh, students can't get visas to come to their university, uh, but there's great demand. And especially if there's a new city, there will be great demand because there'll be young populations moving there. Uh, then uh, we have uh, potential to uh, attract and embed universities in all of our cities and multiple universities. And that's uh, one of our goals. Uh, for raising uh, uh, funds for Peace City, we want to create new financial districts in all of our Peace Cities. And this includes global banks, uh, financial service companies. We want to attract uh, insurance companies, we're actually uh, investigating the idea of creating a uh, Peace City World Insurance and uh, uh, offering uh, uh, a much better package that's in the market now. Uh, we're looking at uh, creating stock exchanges and linking them through our cities, uh, commodity and resource exchanges. And uh, Juan Cabrera, who's with us today, gave me a brilliant idea uh, that... Uh, with uh, resources, we don't actually have to exploit the resources. Uh, we can actually trade resources without taking them out of the forest or out of the ground or out of the ocean. And uh, these can be traded and the values will go up on those because they'll be scarcer and scarcer because everyone else is just using them. And uh, so basically we can incentivize the non-use and non-exploitation of resources in our countries, and we can translate that, same as carbon exchange and other things, we can translate that where we're not chopping down forests, we can translate that to social programs where we can build social housing, where we can uh, uh, give people a better start, we, where we can have uh, schools, uh, we can have orphanages, we can do many things, we can have food programs, etc. Next, Munir. Uh, the human element, when we do our master plan design, you have to have these things that are on the list here uh, to have a city as livable. Uh, I've been to many cities in the world that really uh, are, they're overbuilt, uh, they're overstressed, they're overpopulated, they're overpolluted, 
some are not livable anymore. Uh, the quality of life is very poor. And, you know, at the end of the day, it's about the time we have on earth. And uh, we have to have a good quality of life and, and happiness to have peace. Uh, because without, without uh, a good quality of life, a family, a community, a society, uh, there can never be good peace. Next, Munir. Uh, we're creating a, a, a Peace City World Food Program. And as I mentioned a minute ago, the uh, idea is to actually have food security for cities. Uh, I mentioned my grandparents and in their day, uh, everything they had or could consume came from like a 10 mile radius. And uh, if it came from outside, uh, you know, it was probably spoiled by the time it got there. So where we are today, we have stuff that's uh, stored and refrigerated and gassed and then sold to us as fresh five years later. Uh, and we have, uh, through logistics problems because of COVID, uh, because of war, because of uh, uh, various conflicts, we have very insecure food supply. Uh, we saw that during COVID. Now we see inflation, food inflation, uh, is going crazy. Uh, I went to the supermarket the other day here in the U.S., and I, I was actually shocked at the prices. Uh, of course, I was shocked at the prices when I left London, but, uh, but more so here because I didn't expect it here to uh, have risen so much. Um, so what we're doing is we're going to build uh, farming in the cities. And in this, we're going to build actual uh, forests, but not only forests uh, through the city and the parks, uh, we're actually going to uh, embed uh, fruit trees through the city. So there's always fresh fruit, fruit growing. And uh, this is something that uh, uh, if you're hungry, you can just go pick some fruit off the tree. It sounds simplistic, but it's, uh, it's an idea uh, that's meaning good and uh, is practical. Next, Munir. Uh, logistics hubs. Uh, we're actually speaking to governments about... Uh, uh, how uh, they can better serve the world and market and how they can be com competitive. And to be competitive, you have to be able to go to market with your products. And so if you are a country that has good climate, uh, sunshine, you can grow lots of food, you can export food. Because if you are coordinated and uh, there's an effort and a profit to be made from growing food, then people will do that. And uh, if you have manufacturing ability, if you have a, a local product, if you have something that you're making to sell to the market, you need logistics. Uh, if you want to buy from the world, you need logistics. And again, what we found, uh, just as a, uh, an example, in the US, there's uh, nine ports that are mainly uh, used and and probably do about 90% of the trade and traffic coming through the US. And these nine ports are overburdened. And so you have ships lined up outside uh, waiting to enter. And this delays the process, this raises the price. And uh, so our cities, we want to actually include uh, uh, ports. We want to include free zones because uh, free zones are incentives to corporations to uh, manufacture in locations where they're not paying heavy taxes for goods that they're exporting. That actually helps the country once exported because it's created jobs, it's used the materials of the country, and uh, people can actually derive a better life from, uh, from having uh, good logistics and good free zones. Next, Munir. Uh, Invest in our future together. Uh, actually, Peace City World is an economic stimulus platform. Uh, we're not a construction company, as I said earlier. We have many construction companies. We unite the world as our goal. And our goal is to unite the world to build better habitats. And sustainability isn't free. Uh, sustainability has to be uh, planned. It has to be paid for. And... Uh, we have to come up with creative solutions, as, as Juan suggested, uh, where we don't have to uh, uh, take all the resources of a country. We can actually put them on an exchange and trade them and, and leave them where they're at. Uh, and, and, you know, we can actually grow more resources 
we can grow forests, we can grow uh, 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 for carbon exchange, we can do many things. We can clean oceans, we can uh, restock fish. Uh, there, there's many things we can do. And as the globe is changing and as the work uh, is changing and technology is replacing a lot of the old traditional jobs, then basically uh, we need to come with new solutions and we need to work together to do that and we can build a better world. Sustainability uh, includes uh, all of these components and these are all things that can be monitored and looked after uh, uh, for uh, uh, using technology. And uh, all of these can be not only monitored, uh, uh, I jumped to the bottom of the page. We have uh, clean water, rivers, lakes, and oceans. There's ways to clean up. Uh, there's ways to uh, utilize. In, in England, in the north of England, uh, they have a great program where they've filled old, old coal mines, and they're using it for geothermal power. So they have a, uh, a heat return pump that actually goes to the bottom of the coal mine and the water temperature is much different than the surface temperature. And this exchange makes geothermal power. Uh, wind power, of course, is becoming very popular. Solar power is practical in, in sunny countries. Wave power is free. The oceans are, are there everywhere on the planet and there's more water on the planet than land. And so we have hydrogen also. Uh, hydrogen, uh, it's funny because there was hydrogen cars at the, at the start of uh, manufacturing of automobiles uh, and uh, they disappeared, but now uh, we need to bring that back. And I think there's many companies looking at that. Uh, smart grids, uh, the smart grids, how we use energy, uh, how we use lighting, how we uh, deal with waste. Uh, instead of shipping waste to other countries, we need to deal with that waste locally. And uh, waste can actually be uh, uh, repurposed, uh, believe it or not, uh, and, and used for uh, uh, goods and materials that can be manufactured if done properly. Uh, in our uh, sustainability, uh, we also have building materials that isn't on this list that should be and will be added. And uh, basically our building materials, we have some very creative uh, uh, old fashioned building materials that are repurposed. Uh, and we have some uh, new building materials. Uh, we're looking at basalt rock. Basalt rock is, uh, uh, basalt fiber is from volcanic rock. And it was actually, this type of rock was used by the Romans and uh, uh, it was used in Carthage and it was used in many other uh, great cities and empires of the past. And these still stand. And uh, they're good uh, uh, against heat. Uh, they're uh, great insulation. And they also protect against uh, the sun and uh, uh, where you have uh, uh, electric power. Uh, this causes uh, damage to humans. So they also protect against that. And these, all of these things are great sustainability uh, factors. It's not just the fact that... Uh, we're uh, looking at uh, climate action. Of course, climate action is very important, but we need to look at all sustainable uh, uh, elements that uh, make our planet safe and uh, livable for future generations. Uh, again, here we have uh, technology. Uh, we're speaking to uh, hundreds of technology companies uh, and uh, this is the future. And, uh, uh, I'm not totally in sync with it uh, because when I uh, went to school, a bouncing ball electronic typewriter was high tech. And, uh, but now they have things that are just unbelievable. And uh, the, more I, the more I learn about these new technologies, what can be done, uh, they need to be combined, they need to be put into implementation and they may need to be put together for doing good, for that purpose. And uh, many uh, technologies are created for military purpose uh, or space. We need to start using them for doing good and we need to do, use them and purpose them uh, for improving life here on our planet, not on others. Um, 
we're creating uh, uh, duplicate cities in the metaverse for peace cities. And through this, we can, this is almost like a gaming technology. And so this is something that's very interesting for uh, uh, the investment market right now. And they're raising huge funds. And as people learn about it, uh, this is something that we can actually raise funds for social programs in our cities also. So we're going to be raising uh, and duplicating our peace cities in the metaverse and omniverse. And uh, this is, a, uh, I think, uh, another great thing. Yesterday, I had a meeting uh, covering technology, and uh, it was a very uh, insightful, informative meeting. And we're, we have a number of other companies that we're going to approach that uh, I didn't even know existed. So as, as we uh, add these companies, there will be more and more participation of global corporations. And these global corporations can bring money also because there's companies now, especially the tech companies, many of them have more funds and more cash uh, available to invest than countries have. Uh, tech and Smart Cities, uh, we're the advisor uh, on the advisory board uh, for World Smart Cities. Uh, and uh, uh, also we have a number of companies like Microsoft, IOTA, uh, Cisco, Meta, uh, Tesla, and many others that will invite to come to our cities. These companies will create jobs. They'll bring technology to places that have no technology. And uh, our peace cities aren't only going to be in developing countries. We feel that there's a need for new cities in developed countries. And, uh, you know, there's, there's poor and poverty everywhere. Uh, I see poor and poverty in Europe. I see it in the U.S., uh, so you don't have to go to a developing country to see that there's a need to improve lives of people everywhere. Uh, clean transportation is really uh, uh, a buzzword of today. Uh, we have many companies looking at this, uh, and whether it's from rail, road, sea, uh, or air, it's a, it's, a, it's a concept that we need to uh, explore and uh, do quickly. Uh, to meet the sustainable development goals and uh, address the uh, COP26 uh, promises. Uh, here we have uh, uh, hybrid airships that we're looking at creating. We have a partner in Texas that we're looking at creating hybrid airships, flying buses and flying vehicles. And uh, this is something that we're getting involved in. And we can actually also bring these to our cities to create uh, jobs and uh, where we can manufacture these things and where we can have uh, uh, technological hubs of new technology. Uh, and uh, uh, I think this is a, a good thing for the future. This is the technology that uh, uh, isn't scientific. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's today, it's happening now. It's not a future technology. Uh, as you can see, uh, there's a hybrid aircraft at the uh, top left of the uh, screen. Uh, these hybrid aircraft can actually fly around the world and be carbon neutral. They can carry payloads equal to a container ship. And uh, depending on the scale you build them, they can be downscaled uh, to the size of uh, trucks. And uh, they can also uh, be modified to be uh, buses and carry um, passenger buses around cities. And, uh, uh, at some point, they can even be modified to uh, flying vehicles. And this is using hydrogen, tech, hydrogen and uh, uh, electric motors, so it's clean. Uh, they can actually stay in the air for a month at a time. They can fly around the world in three days. And uh, they don't have to follow a road. They don't have to follow a path. Of course, they're slower than uh, jets. Uh, but there again, if you're doing cargo, you don't put that much cargo on jets. But the jets that we will be using, we've also partnered with another company uh, to uh, create uh, uh, hybrid aircraft that uh, uses electric motors and uh, in the future, different power sources that are currently being used that are in, in technology uh, uh, research and development at the moment. And as they come online, uh, we'll be using those in the aircraft also. 
So in brief, uh, building a sustainable peace city is a program for a decade uh, or longer. Uh, and we're looking at doing multiple uh, peace cities and they're in the budgets of the billions of dollars. Uh, how do you actually create the billions of dollars? You get very creative and you invite some of these humongous companies to partner with you and you get governments to uh, supply incentives and support for their own country so that they can build new habitats that are future cutting edge, great places to live humanistic and sustainable and, and address the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And, in, and those are the kind of cities that I'd like to live in. And, and I think that if we can convince uh, the business community, uh, the political uh, uh, wings of countries, uh, that this is good for their people and that uh, everybody can profit in some way and at the end, the end user is the citizens, the people of the countries. And so they can actually profit greatly by living in a fantastic city that has jobs, that has a future for their children, uh, where there's great food supply, where there's fresh drinking water, uh, where there's uh, uh, ample education and health care, and uh, there's sports activities, and there's health and fitness. And uh, this is the kind of city that uh, we all dream of. And as we go towards a less than a five day work week, and as we go to, uh, uh, we need to build more of a social world, a planet that cares about each other, uh, where we care about people. And our focus in uh, creating jobs uh, where we can then afford time and have time to look after our families, our children and our neighbors uh, should be our objective. Uh, we have master plan peace cities and villages. We have a number of peace villages, which are on a smaller scale that are strategically positioned in good locations that will be economic stimuluses for the country uh, on a smaller scale than a city, of course. Uh, but still, a peace village uh, can be a good local stimulus. It can create thousands of jobs and uh, it can actually uh, bring investment to a country. And every dollar that goes in the country can go around that country many, many times before it leaves. So it benefits the whole population of the country. And the companies that come and work with us, it's actually, they're actually creating jobs for their factories at home, in their home country. So what we're doing is we're creating a world stimulus through Peace City World programs, where if we have major, major companies who are manufacturing goods to build a new city, and they're involved in building the new city and they're investing in the new city, you know, you're more likely to support the country and the people that you're actually investing in than a country that you're not. And uh, so again, that builds peace and builds relationships and builds understanding through culture and uh, transfer of uh, uh, information and technology and sharing and trade. And uh, that's what we're all about. So we're open and welcoming to uh, convince that the future of humanity deserves a contribution uh, of all good citizens. And so we're looking for participation and you're welcome to join us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, John, for these uh, fascinating explanations about both uh, what a smart city is and uh, how to develop a uh, very impressive complex schemes of uh, sustainable cities for the future. Um, um, because we are very much about dialogue, we are very keen to have small groups where people can discuss uh, and everyone can speak. Um, so therefore, I'd like to limit the number of questions that will come to you right now uh, to clarification questions only. So if there are any um, clarification questions, please raise your hand and otherwise I'll keep watching. Antoine, there is a question in the chat uh, right. from Sagar Shah. Sagar, would you like to speak to our question or should I read it? Where will the resources I, from smart cities come yeah, from I'm if here. not taken from forests? Yeah, I'm here. Um, can you hear me? Yes, yes please go ahead. Yes, yeah, so um, 
um, the gentleman, um, John, you said, hi, John, you said that to not take the resources from the forests um, for building these new cities, um, you know, that could be concrete, that could be the limestone, that could be so many other resources. So if they're not going to be taken from the forests, where are they going to be resourced from? Well, we, we have uh, we have many materials that can be uh, used. And when we're talking about trees, uh, forests can be replanted and rebuilt. And we have uh, fast grow growing trees that can be uh, cut uh, and rebuild uh, or, or regrown uh, multiple times. So there's those types of trees that grow straight and they're purposed for building and uh, we, can actually, we can actually grow them without attacking existing forests. Uh, there's also uh, a way we can create jobs through uh, uh, giving farmers the opportunity to grow uh, uh, hemp, uh, which is an ancient uh, plant. Uh, and it's uh, one that has been used in, uh, it actually, it actually hemp uh, Crete is a new product uh, that is aligned with old products. If you know in Europe, uh, there's many historic buildings that use uh, lime in the walls and uh, uh, they use straw and other things. We could do the same with hemp. Hemp actually consumes uh, carbon. So it would suck in 25% of the uh, carbon uh, outside in the air and uh, continually do that. And so it would actually clean our cities as we use it. And we can build buildings with that. Uh, we can have compressed earth buildings uh, that uh, is, you know, earth is everywhere on the planet. Uh, we can do many things uh, differently uh, than have been the traditional. Concrete and steel, I mean, we can replace steel with uh, uh, basalt. Basalt is six times stronger than steel, and uh, it's actually cheaper than steel uh, to manufacture. And we can actually, and it's all over the world. So just about every country on the planet has basalt, which is uh, from volcanic rock. So we can actually exploit that, and it doesn't damage the uh, environment, it doesn't damage the atmosphere. And uh, again, we can use that instead of steel. In the U.S., the U.S. Uh, Corps of Engineers are build, rebuilding bridges and roads uh, and have contracted with the same company that uh, we're partnering with for Basalt. Thank you, John. And uh, will these slides be made available at all after today or any other detail or PDFs or anything? Thank you. Well, I, I'm, I'm happy if they are. I have no problem with that. And... Uh, if you want more information, you're welcome to uh, take a look at uh, our website, which is uh, peacecity.world. And uh, there's more information on there. So please have a look and uh, you're welcome to actually even write to us and ask us questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have two, two questions uh, that have come. One is a hand raised by Dr. Nagia Said, and I'll give her the word. And then there's a written question by Mohan from Australia. Nagia? Yeah, thank you very much. It's, it's so wonderful, really, your presentation. And uh, it's bringing back uh, a lot of memories because uh, I remember in 1996, we were attending Habitat 2 in Istanbul. Uh, and, uh, uh, but this was, there was the United Nations Conference and the NGOs conference and the scientific conference. I was attending the scientific conference and we came up with like the 10 commandments for new cities. And then later uh, we tried uh, uh, a few months later to apply it in uh, uh, near Ankara. There was uh, uh, a city called, a new city called Selm Kent that we were putting all our minds together <laughs> and mm -hmm. to see what to do about it. So I'm so glad about you know, your, your presentation, it's so valuable. But I have, uh, you know, a question. How can you fit in, uh, you know, these uh, wonderful ideas to uh, different uh, situations, different environments, considering the profile of the people, the profile of the place, the priorities, etc., and the problems that we might, you know, you might face? 
you know, how can you fit it in? It's not a, just a universal magic solution. <laughs> it will be tailored to different uh, environments. Thank you. Yeah, yes, of course. Um, Thank you. May, Thank if you. I, if I may, John, just group that with the next question. Okay. Um, what area of land would be needed to set up a smart city, land that is ideally accessible to current population centers? That's the question from Mohan. And the question also that's come from Maria. Um, how should cities in most developing and underdeveloped countries that are struggling to, prov to provide basic services such as electricity, water, and sanitation go about starting to imagine smart cities? So I think you may want to, to group your answers to those questions. Thank you. I, get, I can answer the, the last question first. Uh, uh, in developing countries, uh, the country needs to invite us, Peace City World, and we will come up with the master plan uh, and we will come up with a turnkey solution. We will bring the companies uh, that can uh, develop the water supply, uh, develop the uh, uh, plan and jobs and, and bring the investment. And uh, the lady who asked the first question from Turkey, we're actually speaking to the from Turkish... Egypt. I'm from Egypt. I'm ah, sorry. okay. I'm sorry. Uh, well, we're speaking with people in Egypt uh, about a city in Egypt, and we're speaking uh, with the government in Turkey about a city in Turkey. And uh, we're also looking at a peace village in Turkey, uh, not far from uh, uh, the city you mentioned in uh, Ankara. And uh, basically what we're looking at doing is creating these cities with the participation of the government and the citizens. So we need to actually have citizen involvement uh, and government involvement. And of course, no two cities are alike. You can't, uh, you can't take uh, 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 New York City and put it in uh, uh, Greenland. I mean, it, it, you, know, you have to have uh, something that matches uh, the population that uh, works for them culturally, that works for them uh, uh, for biodiversity, uh, for uh, the ecology, for, for all, of the, all of the issues, we need to actually make a study. And we have professional architects and we have professional people uh, from the science world who will help us do that for each location. And I'm sorry, there was another question. I didn't, uh, I didn't get the other question. Uh, it was about the, the um, area of land that would be needed to set up. Ah, yes, yes. Well, the area of land is very important. Just to give you an idea, uh, our average peace city that we're speaking with governments now uh, is about 100 square kilometers. Uh, and uh, it doesn't have to be that big. Uh, the larger the project, the more attraction it is for investment, the more attraction it is for corporations to participate. Uh, if I invite you as a company to come and build a factory and it costs 250 million or, or 500 million to build a factory, you want to know that you have a new market in that city uh, to uh, build that factory and it has a purpose. If it's small, then uh, they'll say, well, we'll just stay where we're at and we'll just ship the goods to you. Okay, so it has no incentive for them. So the bigger the project, believe it or not, the easier it is. Uh, and uh, it, it sounds ridiculous. You think it would be easier to do a small project, but people want to be involved in large projects. And if you have multinational, huge corporations, they, they uh, uh, will uh, all love to come and be involved in large projects. Uh, as far as our peace villages, our peace villages can be anywhere from... Uh, I suppose as small as two square kilometers to 10 to 15, and uh, they can make a, a stimulus and they can actually be added on to existing cities. So that uh, all of our cities have to be near where there's an existing workforce, because uh, we have to uh, transport uh, workers to build the city. We have to have people to occupy the city and uh, Many people from a country and adjacent countries uh, and people now from all over the world can literally live anywhere. We're having a new, with technology, people can literally live anywhere on the planet and do their job from their computer. And there's many uh, countries being smart 
and they're giving new visas uh, for this workforce so that people can come become uh, residents and workers from their country because that alone stimulates the country. It brings foreign direct investment. It brings money from outside into the country and it provides services to these new people who are coming. I'm aware that there are more questions coming, especially on the availability and uh, capacity of certain countries to acquire the technology. But um, I think it would be time for us to split in those small groups.